Good morning, Latrenda Easton here with St. Andrew's African Methodist Episcopal Church here in Sacramento, California, where the Reverend Dr. Jason Thompson is our pastor. We are here continuing our Christian Development School lesson this week. This week, we are Unit 26, Session 2, The Covenant Making Priest. And we are continuing um, through the Gospel Project curriculum, a um, chronological study of the Bible where we are diving deep into the overarching theme and storyline of the Bible, which is God's plan to redeem his people through his son, Jesus. And this week, Unit 26, Session 2, The Covenant-Making Priest. Lord God, we just come before you this morning just praising you, Lord God, for your word. We praise you, Lord God, for your gift of salvation. We praise you and thank you, Lord God, you are our redeemer. And now, Lord God, we, as we just dig into your word this morning, Lord God, we just ask that you would just enlighten our minds and our hearts. And Lord God, I just ask that you would just open our eyes and hear ears to what you have for us this morning. Lord God, I would also ask, Lord God, that you would just um, let these roots, just, just this, these, your word this morning, just root deep in our hearts, Lord God. Let these words pass from reading to our minds to our hearts and then back out into our lives and our conversations lord god we just give you all the glory and all the honor and pray that um, you would be magnified and glorified um, through this lesson we thank you and we praise you amen all right the covenant making priests so today, what we are going to learn, according here in our discipleship guide this week, is in the Lord's Supper, Jesus presented a picture of the sacrifice that he would make on the cross, and he also affirmed that he would be victorious. His kingdom would not fail. Now, as Jesus prepared to go to the cross, and that's where we've been these last several week lessons, we are in that week leading up to Jesus's crucifixion and um, resurrection. And as Jesus prepared to go to the cross, he instituted a new covenant with his people. In Jesus Christ, God would seal salvation through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus. And the covenant did not require anything. It required nothing of God's people because Jesus would complete all the work himself. He would give his life as a ransom for many and he would shed his blood to pay the penalty for sins, for our sins. And so Jesus alone on the cross would complete the work of salvation and the Lord's Supper would be his people's reminder of their redemption in Christ. And so the Lord's Supper, which we, um, um, maybe many of you know today as our Holy Communion. So anywho, a setting and context for this lesson this week in our passage is Jesus is continuing his march to the cross, but he stopped to celebrate Passover with his disciples. And so the time of his departure was near his death and one among them would betray him. But yet Jesus did something more than simply predicting his death and resurrection. Jesus performed the first Lord's Supper. Now, Christians and believers have taken the Lord's Supper, or you may know it as the Holy Communion, ever since, ever since as a reminder of Jesus's broken body and blood shed upon the cross. And so this signifies the new covenant between Jesus and his people, the body of believers, a promise that was sealed by Jesus's blood to save his people from their sins. And so we're going to look at three aspects here in our session outline. The Son of Man will be betrayed as part of God's plan. The Son of Man will be sacrificed as part of God's covenant. And the Son of Man will be celebrated as part of God's kingdom. So let's jump right in here with point one. The Son of Man will be betrayed as part of God's plan and as part of God's plan of salvation. So follow along as we read Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 25. On the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, where do you want us to make preparations for you to eat the Passover? Go into the city to a certain man, he said, and tell him. The teacher says, my time is near. I am celebrating the Passover at your place with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them and prepared the Passover. When evening came, he was reclining at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, Truly, I tell you, one of you will betray me. 
Deeply distressed, each one began to say to him, Surely not I, Lord. He replied, The one who dipped his hand with me in the bowl, he will betray me. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for him if he had not been born. Judas, his betrayer, replied, Surely not I, Rabbi. You have said it, he told him. That was Matthew chapter 26, verses 17 through 25. Now the passage, the passage here mentions both the Feast of Unleavened Bread and it also mentions the Passover. Now, some see the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread to be the same, but to make a distinction here, Passover is one day and the feast is a period of seven days that follows Passover where only unleavened bread is eaten. Now, both of these are a time to remember and to celebrate how God had rescued his people out of Egypt from the bondage of slavery, as recorded in Exodus chapter 12 and Exodus chapter 23, which tells us that in the 10th plague, God sent the angel of death to kill the firstborn son in every home that did not have the blood of lamb on the doorpost. And if the angel saw the blood, he passed over that house and the lamb's blood was their salvation. So that's what the people here, the disciples in this passage were celebrating during the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Now, if we were to take a look at our Passion Week map here, we see the traditional location of the upper room. And if we were to look here at our Passion Week timeline, you will see that we are on Thursday. That's where we are in Passion Week, which is that week leading up to Jesus's death and resurrection. Now in verses 17 through 19, Jesus directed his disciples to go to a certain man and to let him know that my time is near and he would keep the Passover at his house. Now Jesus was speaking of the time of his impending death and sacrifice. Now, because many of the people in that day expected the Messiah to be a political and a military leader who would restore the nation of Israel, not die for the world, Jesus' disciples, they had a hard time understanding that Jesus' death was all part of God's plan. Now, Jesus, in celebrating the Passover, he was alluding to how his blood would be spilled for our salvation. See, God's plan in the Passover to save his people and in Jesus, the sacrifice of himself to save the world was very precise. So Jesus' death during Passover pointed to God's continual love, his continual love for us and his plan of salvation for his people through a sacrifice. Now here in verses 20 to 25, even Judas' betrayal was all a part of God's plan, even if Judas was in full control of his own actions. Now, this is where we see kind of God's plan in human action. Because in, in Proverbs 19, we see that God's sovereignty over all of life encompasses the free actions of human beings. So in ways that we are just not able to comprehend fully, God's plan, the Lord's plan goes forward through, even through the choices of human beings as moral agents. So even freely chosen sinful actions are factored into God's overarching plan. That's his sovereignty, as in the case with the crucifixion of Jesus, an event that both purposed by God through foreknowledge, but yet it was also carried out by the wicked decisions of human beings. And we, we um, and, and knowing that God is working, so Romans 8.28 tells us, you know, knowing that God is working all things for the good of those who love him, we can trust in God's promise to fulfill his plan, even when we do not fully understand our present circumstances. Now, understanding God's sovereignty and human free will can be difficult to understand. It's difficult for me to comprehend and wrap my, my mind about. But um, we can see, you know, how God's plan and our choices work together. But we do know that God is sovereign over all, and we do know that we are responsible for what we do. And here in our text, Jesus and Judas, they kind of help us to see how both divine sovereignty and human responsibility work together in God's grand plan. Now, according to scripture, both are true 
and real at the same time. Now in verses 20 to 25 um, tells us about Judas's role in betraying the Messiah. But Jesus held fast to the plan. Jesus knew what his future held, but that did not mean that Judas's betrayer was innocent. Judas betrayed Jesus to his own accord, of his own accord and of his own will. So Judas was guilty of the sin and Jesus knew his death was coming. Now, as Jesus and his disciples gathered for their final meal together, Jesus foretold what would happen that very night. And the disciples were forced, they were forced to look inside their hearts. But you know what, Jesus would continue to reveal his plan. So here in point two, the son of man will be sacrificed as part of God's covenant. The son of man will be sacrificed as part of God's covenant. And follow along as I read Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take it and eat it. This is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That was Matthew chapter 26, verses 26 through 28. Now here in verses 26 and 27, the Lord's Supper, we see the Lord's Supper in its symbolic use. Now, the Lord's Supper is a symbolic act of obedience whereby members of the church, the body of believers, through partaking of the bread and the fruit of the vine, memorize, memorialize the death of Jesus, our Redeemer, and we anticipate his second coming. Now, in this passage, Jesus and his disciples, they were eating the Passover meal, and this was a specific meal of remembrance with each element, an important piece of the Exodus story that I referenced earlier. Now, traditionally in the Passover meal, the, 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 the um, Passover meal, the narrative of God's redemption would be told throughout the meal. That's the redemption of the whole Exodus story would be told throughout the meal. But here, Jesus gave new meaning and he initiated a greater salvation, not just for the Jews, but for all who would trust in Jesus' sacrifice on their behalf. So Jesus started with the bread. Verse 26 says he blessed it, he broke it, and he commanded them to eat it. But what he said next was unusual, kind of to say the least. He said, this is my body. And see, the broken bread symbolized the broken body of Jesus. Now, of course, his body was not yet broken, but it soon would be on the cross. And Jesus had previously told his disciples that he would be killed in Jerusalem. And at the Last Supper, he reinforced that prophecy. And here in verse 27, Jesus took the cup and again, he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples and he commanded them all to drink it. So both the bread and the cup are to represent Jesus's sacrifice, his broken body and his blood poured out. Now, looking at the Lord's Supper with fresh eyes, that should change. That should change the way that we approach partaking of it within the church because it reminds us to remember God's saving work and not to just take it for granted um, or take it without any thought. We should not be taking the Lord's Supper without any thought. It should remind us of God's saving work. And it should remind us to confess our sins while knowing that God forgives our sins. It should remind us to celebrate this new covenant that we have with Jesus Christ. Now, in verse 28, Jesus brought a new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Now, this new covenant that Jesus initiated was the fulfillment of all of the promises that were found in the Old Testament. All of the Old Testament points to Jesus. Now, as that first covenant in the Old Testament was sealed, it was sealed with the blood of goats and bulls. This new covenant is sealed with the blood of Jesus Christ. Now that phrase, the blood of the covenant, has deep Old Testament roots. So when God led the people out of Egypt to the promised land, he made a covenant with his people. God in Exodus chapter 24, God commanded Moses to throw the blood of sacrificed animals upon the people to seal the covenant that the Lord had made with them. 
Now in the Old Testament, there were only two other times that blood is thrown upon people. It's at the consecration of the priest in Leviticus and the cleansing of the leper also in Leviticus. And one commentator points out that both of these signify the transition from defilement to newness of life in the service of God. Now the blood of Jesus was spilled upon the cross and it became for us the means of cleansing our souls before a holy God, you know, which we cannot do. And by enduring crucifixion and God's wrath against sin for us, Jesus's blood grants forgiveness. And as our sacrificial substitute, Jesus's blood was shed so that ours doesn't have to be. Jesus's life was given for us. Now, by the act of God's mercy and God's grace, Jesus's righteousness is granted to us, to the believer. And in Christ, we have the security of the covenant promises. Now, a covenant, I wanted to tell you what a covenant is. A covenant is a binding promise made by one person to another to bless or serve them. So that word covenant helps us understand the security found in Jesus' sacrifice because Jesus promises to be with us faithfully. Jesus promises to give us eternal life with him for those who believe. A covenant or a promise from God cannot be broken. And you know what? God's promise to his people is to do what we cannot do on our own. So to save us from our sins and to cleanse his people forever. And it helps us, gives us an understanding of the importance of God's covenant that assures us of his salvation and it frees us from the fear of his wrath. Now, Jesus met with his disciples for a final meal in the upper room. And there he initiated the terms of the new covenant sealed by his blood. But he continued by reminding them that he would see them again. And we see that here in point three, the son of man will be celebrated as part of God's kingdom. The son of man will be celebrated as part of God's kingdom. So follow along as I read Matthew chapter 26, verses 29 through 30. But I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. After singing a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. That was Matthew chapter 26, verses 29 through 30. Now, even though here in verse 29 that Jesus was about to suffer and die, he was going to accomplish the salvation of his people, allowing them to enter the kingdom with him for eternity and celebration. So one day Jesus is telling his disciples he would join them again around the table. They would join him around his table. So this was a prophecy of future joy. And so Jesus ends their time together with his disciples with eternal hope. His father has a kingdom. And remember, we spent a whole quarter on that kingdom. Jesus is going to it and he's telling his disciples they will be there one day too. And so the salvation brought about on the cross accomplishes redemption for God's people. And so the Passover meal Jesus shared with his disciples was a foretaste of the family meal to come in the father's house. Now, knowing that, that the believer will see Jesus one day encourages us every day. Knowing that I will see Jesus one day encourages me every day. It gives me joy just anticipating that future day. It gives me hope for a future kingdom. And it also gives me peace knowing that everything in this life, this life is temporary. And so this last supper here ends with a song of worship, giving God the glory and rejoicing in his faithfulness, anticipating the fulfillment of God's salvation plan. So as the last supper ended, Jesus and his disciples, they sang a song of praise to God together. And it was the most fitting end to their time together before Jesus endured the suffering on the cross. And that brings us to our response. You know, after Jesus made a covenant in the Old Testament with Israel and he sealed it through animal sacrifices, the people of God, they broke the covenant. They worshiped false gods. They turned away from God and they turned to the things of the world. But God promised them to enact a new covenant in which he would forgive sins and write his law on his people's hearts. And at the Last Supper, Jesus explained that his sacrificial death would establish this new covenant and bring forgiveness of sin.
So when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we look back to Jesus Christ's finished work and we look forward to Jesus' glorious return when we celebrate it with him. And as Jesus neared the end of his earthly life, he knew what awaited him, that the Son of Man would suffer and die on behalf of his people was the gospel story that was told from the opening pages of the Bible all the way back in the book of Genesis. And as the first covenant was sealed by animal blood in the Old Testament, the new covenant here in the New Testament was sealed by Jesus' blood to rescue people beloved by the Almighty God. So when you think about, just think about the characteristics that describes a God who would sacrifice his own son to redeem humankind. And isn't it striking, or I find it striking, that Jesus and his disciples ended the Last Supper with singing. I mean, praise is always the proper response to God's work. And even when the future appears grim, the Bible helps us to see that the future for God's people, the believer, is always bright. God is on his throne, everything is going his way, and he loves us. And because of these truths, we can sing praises to him out of a truly joyful heart because we know that the steadfast love of God never ends. So how does the good news of the gospel compel you to praise God? And what Jesus did on the cross was the only way to save God's people forever. And because he accomplished his work, we now have the greatest story ever told to share with the world that desperately needs to hear it. Our message is one of a savior who came to save his people, who stooped low to wash their feet, who gave his body and shed his blood to atone for their sins, to give his life as a ransom for many. It is the greatest story ever told, and it's our story to share it with everyone that we know. So with whom can you share the good news of salvation this week? Have you accepted the good news of salvation? Oh, Father God, we thank you that you fulfill your promises. And Lord God, we thank you for sending your son to die for our sins. And Lord God, we are so thankful for your grace, for your mercy, and for your love. And Lord God, just help us show that same mercy, help us show that same love to others this week, all for your glory. Amen. All right, I will see you all next week, same place, same time, and we will continue with um, Unit 26, session three. I pray that you all have an amazing and a blessed week. And if you're in the Sacramento area, join us in person for our conversation at nine o'clock for Christian Development School, or join us for worship at 1030 at 2131 8th Street here in Sacramento. Be blessed. Mm -hmm.